I wanted to take some time to look at Psalm 119. We were talking about the sovereignty of God, and really it's interesting when you start thinking about the issue of revelation and that which has been given to us. It really demands, and this is a, really a, for us a, a, in our belief, the presupposition that there is a God who exists, a God who is sovereign, a God who can interject himself into history and make himself known to us. And it's interesting because as I was thinking back on Acts, and we looked through the sweep of the whole entire book and saw God's sovereignty throughout that book, it's amazing how many times God actually did intervene into history itself by the sending of messengers such as angels who set Peter free from prison and so on just to see how God works and God made himself known and how he would make his plans known to his people. And so along those lines as I think about that and we think about the revelation of God, I want to spend some time thinking about the Word of God because really it is an amazing gift that we have. The fact that we can stop each day and we can sit and we can read this, God's Word. And the fact that I can read it and I can know God. I mean, it's amazing. I'm reading through 1 Samuel and, you know, I had gone through and I, I try to read through the key 11 books of the Old Testament because there's key 11 books and everything else is sort of complementary to those 11 books. But it's just awesome to watch God working in history, how He guides His plan, how He leads. He makes a covenant with Abraham. He's going to fulfill that covenant. Even when Abraham tries to do things under his own power and he wants to have Ishmael be that seed, God says, no, I told you I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to provide that seed for you. But all the way through, just keep seeing God work to see His mercifulness. I mean, he did not give David what David was due without a doubt for his sin. God was merciful. God is gracious. And it's just, it's, it's awesome to me that we can just sit down and read the Word of God. That He has made Himself known to us. I mean, if we were left to our own devices, if we didn't have this revelation, all we had was general revelation, our knowledge of God would be extremely limited. We would know that He exists. But there's no way that we could know Him to the depth that we can because we have this. And I wanted to spend some time with Psalms 119 and talk about the ABCs of the Word of God. And essentially that is what we have with Psalms 119. And it's interesting because, you know, as I started thinking through this, <clears throat> I was thinking about the fact that we can know the Word of God so that we can know the God of the Word. And that's really what we're after. You know, I, teaching Greek and Hebrew, I try to... to, to explain and, and to make known the fact that it's not about the language. The language isn't the in and of itself. The in and of itself is to know God and to know Him as accurately as we possibly can. And really that is what we are attempting to do. When we come to the Word of God, we are coming to Him. We want to know Him. We want to know who He is. And we want to have fellowship and communion with Him. And we want to be molded and shaped and guided by what we come to know of Him. But I was thinking through my life, and it's interesting, several verses that, that really became important to me. The first one was way back in, in college, early years. <clears throat> Hebrews 4.12. You know, I can remember when we lived at Pickens Canyon, on the, just the, the base of the hills. And I remember my grandma McDowell came to stay with us for a while. And... Uh, She's always just sort of had this aura about her. She just was a godly woman. You just knew that. And I remember one day walking into Pickens Canyon, the front doors, and, and I'm walking in, and there were double doors. They had front double doors, and then there was this sort of entryway, and then another set of double doors. And I walk in, and there she sits in this blue chair back in the corner, her feet up on the footstool, and she's reading her Bible. And I just, those images have just been so impressed upon my mind. You know, I walk in, I see her that I remember Grandma Holly. She lived with us for a long time in Huntington Beach or Fountain Valley, actually. And I remember walking back into her back room. I'd go down the hallway downstairs and far back room on the right and walk in. I spent a lot of time with Grandma back there. and We'd just sit and talk. But there's so many times I'd walk in, she'd be sitting back there in a recliner and she's reading her Bible. I can remember as a kid, you know, I, I had just, I was always up late. I never went to bed early. 
And sometimes I would just get up and wander the house just because I couldn't sleep. And then I remember just get up. So many nights I would get up and walk down the hall and there's mom sitting there with her feet up in the chair reading her Bible. And sometimes I wouldn't sleep through the night and I would be up early in the morning and dad would get up early at one o'clock and then I would walk out and same thing. I would see dad sitting out there in his suit and tie, sitting in a chair, reading the Bible before he went to work. See, all of these things made an impression upon me. What it told me was that the Word of God is vital in our life as believers. And there are certain passages that really have shaped my thinking in regards to the Word of God. And really, that's what I would challenge you, is just to let the Word of God shape for you your view of the Word of God and how we should respond to it or come to it. But one of the verses is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When I really first started thinking about this verse back in my early years of college, it just struck me that the Word of God is living and active. Man, it can change lives. And so many lives over the years I've watched, not only my own life, but the lives of others, just people coming before the Word of God. And as we expose ourselves to the Word of God, as we come to the Word of God and we open ourselves up and say, here it is, scrutinize my life, change it. It has power to transform our lives. It's living and active. I always think about this, you know, when I have a chance to, to share with a non-believer because I realize the power of the Word. It, doesn't, it isn't the power of my words, it's the power of His Word to change their life. Another couple of verses, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2-3. through 3, Like newborn babes, insatiably thirst or long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. This is how we should come to the Word of God, insatiably thirsting, wanting to be fed, wanting to be nourished, having such a desire. And we read from the verses in Psalms 119, verse 5, Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes, that I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. The longing of having a life of integrity before the Word of God. There is this personal, subjective desire, it's amazing, this psalmist reveals about himself. Psalm 119, verses 47 and 48. I put these verses up here. I shall delight in your commandments, which I love, and I shall lift up my hands to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. See, it's just letting the Word of God shape our view of the Word of God. How do we approach it? When I meditate on these things, I realize the, the, the vitalness of being in the Word of God as a believer. There isn't a verse that I can think of, and maybe you can correct me, I can't think of a verse anywhere, at least in the New Testament, that tells us we need to read the Bible every day. But when I read Psalms 1 and that he delights in law of the Lord, he meditates on it day and night, I see that it should be something that is actively permeating our life on a daily basis. It should be. The more that I come to the Word of God, the more I realize I need to be in it on a daily basis. I need to be there in communion with God. Psalm 119 is an amazing psalm. It's one of the longest psalms in the Psalter. And it's really of great intellectual achievement. I mean, you read through it and it seems really repetitious. If you try to read through the whole entire psalm in one sitting, you would think, okay, I just keep seeing these phrases over and over again. It seems repetitious. But understand, it's a beautiful psalm and it's an alphabetic acrostic psalm. So I give you an example. The first stanza that we'll look at this morning, verses 1 through 8. Basically what the psalmist did was he went through the Hebrew alphabet and for every letter of the alphabet, which are 22 letters, he writes a stanza using every single letter of the alphabet. And so the first stanza, every single line begins with Aleph, which is a glottal stop. This is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And he does this all the way through the psalm. It's amazing. It's amazing how this has happened. I mean, it's just a beautiful piece of work. It's really true poetry. 
And we can't get into all the grandeur of it nonetheless, but just to point that out to you, that it is a beautiful hymn, and, and we have it indicated in our, in our text, our English translation. Some of them actually put the letters up there. And if you have that, you can learn the Hebrew alphabet by it. But each stanza then is based off one of the Hebrew letters. And it really is just one of the most beautiful psalms, but the focus of it is really on the devotion to the law of the Lord. And the NESB titles this Meditations and Prayers Relating to the Law of God. And that really is a great title for it. And that is the focal point of it. But at the same time we look at this, we will find that the psalmist reflects absolute devotion to the Lord. There is this intimate relationship that the psalmist has to God. And the psalmist is just going to bear himself to us. And he's going to open up his heart to us and show us some of his struggles. But he reveals the fact that he has experienced the oppression of evil. He's pursued by the arrogant. He's been surrounded by wickedness. He's been humbled by sorrow and disgrace. But at the same time, every time he's always finding Finding his refuge in God. And not just in God, but in his word. And I just read this to you. Turn with me to the, the, the verse 25 and following. Daleth, this is the stanza, Daleth. Verse 25. Verse 25 and 28. Notice this. My soul cleaves to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Verse 28. My soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to your word. All the way through here, we see he faces these oppositions in life, and he faces this suffering and sorrow. But in the midst of all of this, he keeps going to God as his refuge. He keeps going to the Word of God. So much in my life, I think, it just more and more it increases as the years go on, that this is the place I go to find my solace. When I was overseas on a missions trip, I remember I was with a group of people, and we went through training together before we left, but it was in the middle of my senior year. There was so much going on. I really didn't know this group of people that well, and then all of a sudden I find myself in a foreign country with a bunch of people I really don't know well to do ministry. And I remember it just struck me that here I am in a foreign land. I really don't know anybody. I'm, I'm helping serve these other churches and meeting strangers and living in strangers' homes. And it really just dawned on me that as long as I have God and as long as I have His Word, I'm okay. And it really has been for me over the last few years the place that I go find solace. There have been times where I felt like my soul cleaves to the dust and the only thing that's going to bring me life and pick me up, it's the Word of God. There are times when your soul languishes and grieves and the only thing it's going to restore is the Word of God and His promises in it. And I would hope as we go through this psalm that, again, it really would shape your view of the Word of God. And, and it really is that for you, that it is your place of solace. It is your place of comfort. It is your place that you go to for refuge because in it we find out about the God that we worship, the one true God. All of it's interesting as we come to this first stanza and begins like so many sections and it's going to deal with the issue of obedience. You know, if I were to ask you this question, why, or if someone asked me this question, why should I read the Bible every day? Simply this, verse 4. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. God has given us our, His revelation to us so that we may be obedient to it. He has given us the rules by which we must live. He has established the order, not only for this universe, but also for His people. He has given us this revelation, and we are to keep it. <clears throat> this psalm gives appreciation to, and commendation for Israel's revelation-based ethics. The psalmist has a privilege of really celebrating the fundamental reality of the Word of God. It's a central to the life of the nation of Israel. It's central, central to our life. And really, if you think about it, we should be, understand this, we should be people of the book. We really should. The Jews were known for this. They were known for being people of the book. We should be known for being people of the book. The, the problem with the church today so often is we are people of the books about the book, not people of the book. I'm not saying you can't read these other books, but this should be the fundamental source that we go to. This should be the place that we go to on a daily basis. If we have questions about anything in life, if there's anything that we're in a quandary about, about how we are supposed to live, 
and do and believe and behave. This is the first place we should go to. And I've had friends who do that, you know, they're struggling in marriage, and so they go and they pick up all the books off their shelf that have to do with marriage rather than just pick up the Bible. We need to be people about the book. And the amazing thing is God has given us His revelation. This verbal revelation, God has made Himself known to us. All that we need to know about life is right here. And this is what makes us distinct from everyone else. It really does. Not only that we worship Jesus Christ and we have a relationship with Him, but what makes us distinct is that we have the Word of God no one else can really make that claim. We have the Word of God, the truth, and we shouldn't apologize for that, please. We should never apologize for that fact. It's a fact. But God has given us this revelation for a purpose, and I take you to the first stanza, Aleph, and the first thing we find are some objective facts. And then I love how it starts out because it really, it, it, it's going to entice us to get into the psalm. It's going to entice us to get into the Word of God. And it does this by establishing these objective facts. And a few of the things I want to point out for you first is this. Blessed are those who live by the Word with constancy and commitment. And that's verses 1 through 3. And really, 1 through 4 is really the objective facts that are established. 5 through 8 are the subjective. Well, we see the psalmist really then bearing his soul in response to what's happening here. But notice with me, verses 1 through 3. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe His testimonies, who seek Him with all their heart. They also do new unrighteousness, and they walk in His ways. And there's some pretty heavy statements here. I mean, like verse 3, the beginning part. They also do no unrighteousness. He's establishing first the, the, the fact that there is a state of blessedness. And, and really, it's an enviable state in one sense, if we can say that. But really, it's not even about the state nor the people, really, when we look at the psalm more clearly. But it's interesting because he begins with, with two statements. Verse 1 and verse 2 begin with Ashrei, how blessed, how blessed, declaration. Reminds me, if you turn with me back to Psalm 1. And it's reflective of, if you will, of a wisdom psalm. <clears throat> as much as Psalm 1 is as well. And Psalm 1 is interesting because Psalm 1 really is, it's the gatekeeper for the Psalter. And it's a beautiful preface to everything that is going to follow because when you walk through the Psalter, when you read through the rest of the Psalms, you see the ups and downs and struggles with life, but this sort of sets the stage. This is the ideal. This is what you strive after. This is what you long for. And, and really, when you look at it, this is something that, that we keep in mind as we read through it all. We come to the final end of the Psalter, 150. There's just this outbreak of praise and worship, the last few Psalms. And really, that is what's going to happen at the end of it all when God can consummates his entire plan, there's just going to be a great day of worshiping and fellowshipping before the presence of God and how amazing that's going to be. And no longer we're going to be struggling with the ups and downs of life and so on, but this is really the gatekeeper of it. Notice Psalm 1 verse 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand on the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. This has always sort of blown me away because really it's a statement of we have these perfects that run through here, and then the negative particle, low, which means absolutely never. But notice this, how blessed, if I put it the right way, how blessed is the man who never walks in the counsel of the wicked, who never stands in the path of sinners, who never sits in the seat of scoffers. We could say, well, that's impossible, right? I mean, who lives a sinless life? But that's the ideal. That's the ideal. And this describes someone who sits in a state of blessedness. It's the same thing we have back at Psalm 119, verses 1 and 2. How blessed, how blessed. Asherah, asherah. You see, I want, I want to live in that state. I, I want to know what true blessedness is. I, I want to know what true happiness is. And when you think about it, really, that is, that is true happiness in life. That is true blessedness. When you are right with God, when you are walking constantly and consistently with God, when there is that period in life where you are just, you know, you know that you are in deep communion with God, there's nothing better than that. There's nothing better than that. I think about a period in my life when I was not walking the way I ought to walk. 
I could not say that I, I was not walking in the way of blamelessness. I did not have a life of integrity. In that period of my life, man, I was always looking over my shoulder, driving in the car. I'm looking in the rear view mirrors and side mirrors to see if there's going to be flashing lights behind me. You see, I never had a moment of peace, not from the Holy Spirit nor from the law. You see, when you know you're not right with God, there is no blessedness. There is no happiness. There is no serenity. I think if turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. I love these verses. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 21. My son... Verse 20 of chapter 3, My son, let them not vanish from your sight. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, so they will be life to your soul and adornment to your neck. Then you will walk in your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor of the onslaught of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. That's serenity. You know, the one thing I think that I, I really strive to do is that if I can lay my head in my pillow at night and know that I'm in peace with God, I'm all right. But I want to live in that perpetual state of blessedness and happiness. I want to know that I'm walking in complete commitment and constancy with God. It's an enviable state, really. We should all desire that, that, to be in that state of rightness. But this is the objective fact. How blessed are those whose way is blameless. How blessed are those who observe His testimonies. They also do no unrighteousness. They're living, if you will, life integrated around the law of the Lord. We see this in verse 1. Notice, who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 2, who seek Him with all their heart. Notice verse 3, they walk in His ways. Where do we find His ways? In His Word. This is where He has revealed His ways to us. They live their life integrated around the Word of God. See, I take you back to verse 4. Why did God give us His precepts? That we should keep them diligently that we should integrate our life around the Word of God, that it is His Word that guides us, that directs us, that gives us the principles for life. Notice with me in verse 11, I love this verse, Your word I have treasured in my heart, that what? That I may not sin against you. You see, this is how we face the temptations in life. This is how we face the struggles. This is how we face the opposition. This is the armor that God has given us. Blessed are those who integrate their life around the Word of God. When you do that, you know that you're walking right with God. Notice this. It has to do with outwardness, if you will. Their walk. This is their conduct, their way of life, their course of life. They walk in the law of the Lord. It's the law of the Lord that shapes that and directs it, but it's also inwardly. Look at this in verse 2. The heart who seek Him with all of their heart. Notice this. Not undivided. Totality. And they are continuously seeking Him with all of their heart. And just think about this. I mean, when you come to the Word of God, is this how you approach the Word of God? Do you seek Him with an undivided heart? And what's amazing about this statement is not that I seek His statutes, that I seek His testimonies. I seek what? I seek Him. I seek Him. I come to have fellowship with Him. I come to commune with Him. I come to know Him so that I can walk closer with Him. You see, this is the only place that I come to know Him. And there's only one way to serve God, with an undivided heart. You can't serve God with a heart that's split. You need to serve God with a single heart, a heart that is not divided. And so when we come to the Word of God, this is how we need to approach it. We seek Him with the totality of our heart. And sometimes we do this. We know we have certain areas of our life that we just don't want changed. I know, so I'm always challenged by Proverbs. You know, the wise man receives rebuke and correction. <laughs> I don't know about you, but sometimes I really have a hard time when people tell me things I already know I need to change. <clears throat> As my parents growing up as a kid. 
They say, I know there's things in my life. I know I need to change them. And then someone comes and tells me. And, and the last thing I want to do is give them the, the benefit or the privilege of, of saying, oh, see, he changed because I, I, I told him this is what had to happen in his life. And I didn't want to give them that satisfaction. So that made me even more resolved that I'm not going to budge from my position, even though I know it's wrong and I need to change. More and more I'm challenged by the Word of God. I need to be one who is open to correction, one who is open to reproof. I need to have those areas of my life exposed to the Word of God. I can't hide certain parts of my inner life from God and say, okay, this is the part I'm going to bring to you. This part I'm going to keep for myself. I need to expose it all, and I need to come to Him with the totality of my heart, continuously seeking after Him. It's a habitual thing. It's a habitual thing. They are, if you will, then people of integrity. They are blameless. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, sometimes translated complete, but this is what it's dealing with, the issue of integrity. And this is really what the psalmist reflects on when he talks about in verse 6, Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I want to grow in the area of integrity. It's interesting because this same word is likened to the word we find in the New Testament. We've seen it before in Philippians talking about the issue of that we would be blameless children of God. It's really the same thing. It's what we strive for. We want to be known as people of integrity. How do we do that? By coming to the Word of God and allowing it to shape our lives. And really, when we look at these statements, these objective facts, and these statements of blessedness, it's not the people really that are being praised here. It's really the Word of God. They are who they are because of the Word of God. Notice the statements that come. In verse 1, notice those who are blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe His testimonies. Verse 3, they also do no unrighteousness. Here's the qualifying statement, they walk in His ways. The real praise here is not the individual, it is the Word of God, because if it wasn't for the Word of God, they would not be subjects of these beatitudes. They would not be the subjects of these statements of blessedness. It's the Word of God and what it does in your life. As I walk in it, this is what it will do. As I see seek Him out and if I search for Him, as I walk in His ways, this is what's going to happen, you see. These are the things that the Word of God produces in my life. It's not a psalm about praising the individual as much as it's praising the Word of God and its effects in our lives. They are who they are because of the Word. Notice this, the other objective fact, because it is His Word and is intended to be obeyed. And it's an emphatic statement here, and put it for you, you yourself ordained to keep. And I love this statement at the end, to keep. The shmore. It, it's to watch, it's, it's to preserve, it's to guard. It's interesting because when, I, when I'm thinking about this, it's not just the issue of hearing the Word of God or hearing His precepts or hearing His statutes or hearing His testimonies. It's about keeping them. It's about preserving them. As we take the principles from God's Word and we apply them to our life and we live them out, we preserve those principles. When we pass those on to our children, we are in the act of preserving those principles. We are in the act of guarding those things. It's not just passively listening and hearing, but we actually are to guard these truths that are given to us. They are to be kept by us. See, really, they are just cherished morsels of truth that God has given us. I love this. First and Second Timothy, John Stott wrote a commentary on, on First Timothy and he entitled it Guarding the Trust. Guarding the truth. That's what we do. God has given this to us. It's not just merely to hear it, but we preserve it by applying it to our life and living it out and passing it on. But this is why God has given us His precepts. He ordained them so that we would keep them. If you ask yourself, why should I get up next morning and read my Bible? That's why. That's why. The subjective longing that comes, and I love this because it, it follows on the heels of these objective facts. There is personal longing, and there should be. And it's interesting, again, as we go through this psalm together, we'll see how the psalmist just opens up his heart and he, he bears himself. But notice verse 5, Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. 
There is a longing, if you will, for steadfastness, for loyalty, for faithfulness. You see, when you meditate on the objective facts of those who live truly blessed lives, those whose lives are integrated around the Word of God, those who live with commitment and constancy around the Word of God, you see, those who live lives of integrity, all of a sudden the psalmist breaks out and says, Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Man, God, I wish I could be like that. I want to be steadfast. I want to be loyal. I want to be faithful to your word like that. Is that how we approach the word of God? Is that how we come to his word every day? Do we come with that longing, that desire to be found steadfast and faithful? Loyal to the revelation He has given us. Loyal to the principles that are there. Is that just the craving from the depths of our soul and the interjection here? Verse 5 is going to be met by the interjection at the end of verse 8. Do not forsake me utterly. But this is just the craving of his soul, the longing of his soul, all that my ways may be fixed. The term established here is being set in one's ways. In other words, fixed as to their tendency. If I could put it this way, oh, that the bent of my mind might be fixed in the direction to keep your statutes. I want to be this kind of person. I want to live a life of integrity. I want to live a life of blamelessness. Man, I want that. You see, when I looked at those objective facts, I realized this is not me. That's not me. But see, the thing is, looking at our failures, they're not for us to sit and lull us into a state of, of, of lack of movement. Yeah, we recognize our failures, but we also need to look ahead and see what we need to be striving for, and that is the objective goal, to be living in that state of blessedness with God. There is a longing then leading to no shame. Verse 6, notice this. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes, then I shall not be ashamed. And really that is the idea. There is an expectation. There is an expectation when I come to the Word of God that I will not be ashamed. I long to be a person of integrity. I don't want to be ashamed. Notice the second line of verse 6. When I look upon all your commandments, and it is really what I look unto, when I look carefully and thoughtfully at all of your commandments, at the totality of your revelation, I do not want to be ashamed. <laughs> How many times, man, I, I come to the Word of God and, man... I come, I'm aching, I'm hurting, my soul is grieving, and it lifts me up. Those are just awesome times of refreshment, revival of the soul. There are other times <laughs> you come in the Word of God and you're reading and it just starts cutting away at you. It starts exposing the sin in your life. Exposing your failures, your weaknesses. Exposing you for who you really are. I suppose that's probably why some people just don't come to the Word of God. See, it's easier to live a life without coming to it, right? Because if I'm just living life in my own sight, right, of, of what I think is right and wrong and the principles that I think I had to live by, my life's going to be good. And it usually is. There are periods in my life where I, where I wasn't constantly in the Word of God and everything seemed fine to me. And then all of a sudden, I sit down and open the Word of God and all of a sudden, God's going, no, 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 I've got some work to do. And all of a sudden, my life is exposed. And all of a sudden, I realize I just have not been going the way I'm supposed to be going. And I find out, you know what? Ignorance is not bliss. It's not bliss. It's not true blessedness. It's not true happiness. The psalmist looks forward to a time that when he can carefully and thoughtfully look at all the totality of God's commands and not be ashamed when he exposes his life to them. That should be a longing of all of our hearts. 
But we have to be willing then to be able to come to the Word of God and say, here's my life. And, and so often we do is we come to the Word of God to scrutinize it. You see, we read something that God says and we question it because it doesn't sound reasonable to us. And we think, that just isn't compatible with my thinking and my way of life and what I think ought to be or what I think I ought to live my life. But we need to be willing to come and say to the Word of God, expose me for who I am, scrutinize my life. So often we come putting God under the microscope. When we come to the Word of God, we should put ourselves under the microscope. Opened. Ready to be changed and transformed. Emptied. Longing to be filled. Allowing those areas of our lives to be exposed so that we can be people of integrity. that we can pee people, that we can declare we are blameless, that we are those who observe His testimonies, that we are those who do no unrighteousness. This is what we strive for. This is what we strive for. But we have to be willing to allow the Word of God to do its work in our life. There is a resolve that comes from the psalmist. And sometimes we have hard time with these statements and we'll find even more powerful statements, statements of confidence. And I have difficulty when I read those. We'll, we'll talk about as we come to them, but there is resolve here in verses 7 and 8. I shall, notice this, I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. There is this statement of resolve of thanksgiving. I love this word for thanksgiving. It, it, its root means to cast, to throw, and, and more than likely the, the term was based off of the expressions or the, the motions of the actions that, that we're, we're giving and casting and throwing. And it just it's interesting to me when I think about this because you know so many of the words we find in this altar are very expressive. The Jews were very expressive people. We're not very expressive. For me, getting radical during worship is tapping my foot while we're singing. To me, that's radical. I, you know, so if you want to get raised, that's fine. You know what I mean? It's just amazing to me because that is what this word is. It is casting. It is throwing. I think about there's times in your life where God just does something, man. You just can't contain yourself. You know what I mean? And you just, oh, God, thank you so much. See, that's what it is. That's what it is. But notice what drives it. It's not just the emotion. It's not just the, the, the action that, that really is the issue here. What is the issue? Notice what happens when it's statement. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart. Notice when I learn your righteous judgments, you see. See, it's not just merely feeling as my impetus for giving this thanks or, or being so expressive like this with my gratitude. The impetus is, is when I learn His righteous judgments. It's the Word of God. The Word of God inspires worship. It does. And it should. The Word of God should be the content of our worship. It's amazing because Hebrew, it, it has meter, it has rhyme. It's beautiful, beautiful language. But what's amazing to me when I read the Psalter, what is the one element that God has truly preserved here? It's what? It's the words. It's the content. Because that's what really matters. Some of the Psalms, you're reading me go, how, how, how can you sing that? One of, Psalm 105, I mean, it lays out the whole history of the Old Testament. It's like, it's like singing a history book. But what's important to God? It's the words. You see, the Word of God should inspire worship. It should be the content of our worship. It should direct worship. I was talking with Les a few weeks ago as I was driving in the car, and I, you know, I don't listen to Christian radio that often, because usually when I have to drive somewhere or whatever, I take that time to just meditate. <clears throat> House full of six kids. I, I'm home and I study in the office. I, leave, I don't have a lock on my door so that the kids can come in and they can, they can have access to me. I don't want them to ever feel like my life is shut off from them. 
And so, and Tree is, is getting in this thing lately where he wants to come sit in my office and study with me. It's amazing. He's reading this book on prayer. And I, I can't believe he can read. I mean, he just, he's sitting there reading it to me. It's just astounding. The, the theological words, he can sound them out and he's reading and he's, he's comprehending the stuff he's reading. But these moments in the car when I can just sit and meditate and it's just peace and quiet and there's nothing going on. But I decided one day just to turn on the Christian radio, I just felt like listening to some music. Very positive music. Very positive. Clean. But the more that I started listening to the songs, I realized I just have not heard anything about God. There's ethic to them. And they're happy. You know, get you moving in the seat, but there's nothing about God. You see, it should fill the content of our songs. When we sing to Him, we're expressing our knowledge of Him and what He has done. And it also, notice, it also prepares us for the act of worship. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. It prepares me to give worship to God. See, Sunday should be just an a culmination of a week long of just worshiping God with our lives being filled with the Word of God, living out the Word of God. Doing these things are acts of worship to God. We do this with uprightness of heart, and we do this when we learn His righteous judgments. And the term here, righteous, it's interesting. It has to do with the established divine order for things. And that really is what God's judgments are. Th this term has various usages in the, in the Old Testament. Tzedekah. It can refer to that if there is conflict between two people in the community, one is going to be just, one is going to be unjust, one is going to be righteous, one is unrighteous. There's going to be an offender in this. And, and tzedakah is to bring about order. In other words, there is a restoration, a resolve, a reconciliation that happens. And when that happens, that's what you get. You get this righteousness, if you will. It's used in so many different ways. It's used in reference to the marriage as those within a marriage fulfill their roles and functions in the marriage, then there is order, tzedakah. You see, that's what God's judgments do. They give us order, not only for the entire world, but for our life as His people. They lead us, they guide us, they direct us, and, and in so doing, they give us a sense of deliverance and freedom. You see, when I try to order my life, Man, I make a mess of things. And there isn't that sense of freedom, you know, because my, my actions have consequences and I pay the, the price for, for my bad decisions when I try to, to order things for myself. But when I follow His ordering of things, then there is a sense of deliverance, of freedom from all of those things that can obstruct me, sin and whatever else. But it also gives me that sense of freedom because what? I know that I am right with God and I'm walking according to His order. And when it comes to the issue of worship, then I know that when I'm coming before God, God, I'm coming so in an orderly fashion, in a way that is going to be pleasing to Him. And I'm going to worship Him the way He would like me to worship Him. You see, so often worship for us is very self-centered. It's very self-oriented. It's very self-dictated. But if I'm going to His righteous judgments and allow them to establish order in my life, then when I worship Him, I will worship Him with the order that He would expect and the way that He would expect. This last declaration of resolve, I shall keep, and we go back to that verb that we found, our word in verse 4 again. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. He picks up on that word again in verse 8. I shall keep your statutes. And literally, it is your statutes, your statutes, I shall keep. There's such a resolve here. You see, I've, I've reflected on the objective facts. These are those who are blessed. This is the longing of my soul. This is what I want. I want a life of integrity. I don't want to be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. Here is my resolve. I will give thanks to you and I, your statutes, I shall keep. Needs to be a resolve. 
When I come to the Word of God, I need to have this kind of resolve. When I read His Word and I see His principles and precepts, I need to have this resolve that I am going to keep them. I can't come like a wafer. I can't come waffling. Come with a resolve and saying, what I see and what He reveals to me, I resolve that I'm going to keep these things. But notice this, I can't do it under my own power. Notice, do not forsake me utterly. It's with Yahweh's help. You see, this exclamation is, is, is prefaced by the exclamation in verse 5. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. I resolve that I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. Lord, I can't do it alone. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. See, I know the only way that I can have this resolve is if I'm resolved in Him to do. Because I can't do it on my own. This may be the longing of my soul, but within my own powers, there's just no way that I'm going to be a person of integrity. I can't do it without the Word of God, and I cannot do it without Yahweh. I just can't. And really the fullness of this exclamation at the end is, please, oh please, do not forsake me utterly. Don't leave me alone. It's a beautiful starting to this psalm. To establish for us really the ideal state, the state of blessedness. We should all desire to be in that state, to be people of integrity. We should have this kind of longing, verse 5, in our soul for the Word of God. We should long to be people of integrity that when we look at the Word of God, we will not be ashamed. We should have a resolve that we will give thanks to God and that we will keep His statutes, but no, we cannot do it without Him. It's in complete dependence on Him. May the Word of God shape our view of the Word of God. May it shape how we are to come to the Word of God. People ready to be open. People who are exposed. Longing to be changed. So that we can be known for being the people of the book. The people of God. May we know the Word of God so that we may know the God of the Word. Let's pray.